Big Sills National Football Show. Please hit the like button. We appreciate it. By the way, Doc Walker will be with us tomorrow. Part of the broadcast team for the Washington Commanders, the first place Washington Commanders, the three and one Washington Commanders, and Brian Johnson and Cliff Kingsbury doing a great job with Jaden Daniels there in Washington. Their offensive line looks pretty good. Why? They're getting the ball out of the hands of the quarterback quick. So we'll talk to our dear friend, Doc Walker. That will be tomorrow. Before I get Merrill Reese on, there's one thing that I am learning about all of you in Philly. I got a guy who just DM'd me, and it says, Hey, Silio, let me tell you about a couple of three things here about this football team here that, you know, you're, you are sitting at two and two. Okay, a lot of injuries on the football team. We know this. He goes, but let me tell you a couple of the things here. and Let me tell you a couple of three things. Okay? Where are we going with this coach? Where are we going? And you're like, hey, <laughs> holy cow. I think Philly's burning, man. And a man who has seen it. By the way, I wonder how hot he was at Raymond James this past weekend. Because like, like Merrill has said, that's one of the shittiest press boxes in all of pro football. Our friend, the golden voice of the Philadelphia Eagles, it is Merrill Reese. He joins us now here. Merrill, how hot was it in Tampa this past weekend? It, Dan, it might have been hot for the players, but I was sitting up. That's not a bad press box. Oh, that, okay. That's that's not even in the top 20 worst. Believe me. All yeah. I care about, I mean, it's a little cramped because we sit four across with Mike, me, my spotter, and my stat guy. But it's a little cramped, but it's, it's a good view. You're right there at the 40-yard line. You're mid-level. I mean, I judge it by the view. I mean, when we're in Washington or Landover, Maryland, and you're sitting there in the corner and you're low and there's an overhang and you can't see the scoreboard and the fans can sit up against the, the, the window and call you names, or the worst, Hard Rock Stadium in Miami. That place used to be good, but now we're up in the corner someplace. We can't see a third of the field. And the other stadium that is awful is... You can call it what you want. I have renamed it So Far Stadium in Los Angeles. And we are in the end zone, and there's glass up to here. We're in the back of the end zone. That is terrible. So if you're going to talk about Raymond James, I have no complaints. You know what, though? I've heard this, and I've actually been up in the broadcast booth for at t in Dallas. That, that that gigantic thing, don't you have to do your broadcast off the monitors? When they're because, because that 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 thing hangs down so low? No. No, the, the thing is the, the thing is our savior. When when we're at ATT in Dallas, we're in the end zone, we're way up in the air, but it's a huge booth, and anything on our side of the 40 is great. And when they go past the 40 in the other direction from our left to our right. You just call it off the monitor. You just call it off that big screen. But that big screen doesn't ever get in the way. Merrill, let's get into what's getting in the way of this team a little bit here. Obviously, their injuries are going to play a factor. But before I pollute the question to you, let me just ask you, your overview, there's four quarters in a football season. I know now, you know, we have the 17th game, but we used to look at it in four quarters of the right. season, first four, next four. And like you say, and you say it every time you come on this program, the war of attrition. Sometimes you get it late in the year. Sometimes you get it early in the year. Sometimes you get it all year. Sometimes you never get it like you did in 22. Team is 2-2 two and two right now. Give me your overview of what you've seen in the first quarter poll of the season so far. I'd say a little below average. Uh, nothing to be overly alarmed about, although the last game was a mess when, when midway through the second quarter, the Bucks had gained 240 yards in the ground uh, in the overall, and the Eagles had yet to gain a yard. So that that concerns you. A slow start. This is the only team in the NFL that hasn't scored a single first quarter point. So that's that's not good. Uh, Jalen Hurts. I have not. I'm not down on Jalen Hurts. Everybody, you know how they are with quarterbacks. And I remind people sometimes be careful what you wish for. Uh, yeah. But do you think Cleveland right now would trade Deshaun Watson for Baker Mayfield? Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about it. I think they trade him for Tyrod Taylor right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, and, and I'll tell you something else. How about 
How about the Jets? Now the Jets have Aaron Rodgers. But basically, when you talk about the Jets, they gave up on Sam Darnold, and he is ripping it up in Minnesota. So Jalen Hurts is a good quarterback. Jalen Hurts is a great man. He's dedicated. He's coachable. And he's thrown four picks. But that's one less than Patrick Mahomes at this point. How about this, though, Merrill? Let's let, let's expand it, though. Since 2003, in the start of the 2023 season, in 22 games, he's had 27 turnovers. I mean, and Nick even said it in his press conference, it's not sustainable, and it's going to eventually catch us. I mean, that has to be a concern, in your opinion. Maybe the bye comes at a right time that would start to address this. But, I mean, j- just your takeaway on that, because it is becoming weekly, and it's becoming a weekly thing now. I think he'll fix it. I, I really believe he'll fix it. I think Kellen Moore is a is an excellent offensive coordinator, and I think that Doug Nussmeyer, who's the quarterback coach, they'll zero in. They, Jalen's too good and too smart to keep up with them. The fumbles are what really hurts. I mean, four interceptions, there are others with four. And as I said, uh, the, the best quarterback in football right now has five. So, um, you know, Patrick Mahomes has five interceptions. So it's it's too high. And the fumbles, well, the, the fumble he had last week that killed them came on a pass play where the protection broke down and it was, was his hand moving forward or wasn't it? And it was ruled that the ball was knocked out of Nick before the hand started forward. But basically, ball security is important for any, any skill position player. How about the defensive side of the football? I mean, Merrill, you, you can make the conversation about the injuries on the offensive side, but on the defensive side, there's no injuries. And, you oh, know, there are a couple. Well, 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 I mean, the inability of Bryce Huff to get going and Nolan Smith not to get going and the, the inconsistency of the two defensive tackles has to be alarming to Vic because you're getting inconsistency. Look at, I mean, it's one thing to blame the Brazil field. Um, or the heat in Tampa. We're coming up with excuses now here. We'll make the heat in Tampa an excuse because the last thing I checked, uh, both of the teams were playing <laughs> under the same sun. How about this, though? Are you concerned that the defense has gotten out to a slow start outside of New Orleans? I mean, how, and how do you go from a performance like that and then you turn around and it's like the guys didn't even get off the bus in Tampa? I mean, your takeaway on the defensive side of the ball. Well, they, they didn't tackle well. And when you 18 miss tackles, the, the, it, see, if you're not tackling well and they're gashing you for 16 yards here and 15 yards there and then seven there, you're never getting the quarterback a third long or even a second or long. That was the key. The week before, Tampa Bay um, lost to Denver and they sacked Baker Mayfield seven times. Why? Because they stopped their running game. And then, and they were able to tee off on third and long. With this team, this time there weren't many thirds. They 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 did what they had to in first and second. The pass rush wasn't there. But why wasn't the pass rush there? Not because uh, Jalen Carter couldn't pass rush, but the ball was out of the hands of Baker Mayfield too fast. And that would have stopped if the Eagles could have stopped the run or stopped the short gain after a pass. But they didn't. But you know what? When the schedule came out i never looked then for who they're playing when because it doesn't mean anything because you and i don't know in may or april uh, what the eagles are going to be like in mid-november or who the cowboys are going to have in their lineup when they line up i mean look at look at the cowboys right now um with my micah parsons and dexter lawrence so you don't know these things what i look for is when the buy is coming. And when I saw the buy was this early, I said, that's bad. Because let's face it, you want it in late November before the stretch drive begins so that a weary team, a weary team can rest its bodies and get some of the injured back. But not this year. When that game ended, I said, thank goodness for the buy, because this team needs it to reassess, to figure out what is wrong to work on fundamentals and to get some healthy guys back like A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith and their best offensive lineman, Lane Johnson. They need that. And also, 
they're going to get back another player who's been on the injured reserve since the offseason. Actually, he got hurt in the last regular season game last year, Sidney Brown. And he's a good football player. He's a good football player. He'll be back this week, and, and I think he'll be ready soon. Yeah, I heard I heard Vic say that, you know, they're going to clear him for the bye week, and he's going to be active coming out of the bye week and getting ready for Cleveland here. Um, You know, Vic Fangio said something interesting in the offseason. I think you even said you were with him when he said this. I think it was at a golf event or such. And he, you know, someone asked him at a press conference, they go, hey, what do you think of your defense? He goes, hey, Tom, I'll let you know in week 12 how good we are. I don't know. Yep. So did you always think this was going to be a work in progress again, that, you know what, this was going to take its time here before people were going to say that this was going to be an elite defense. I mean, we're now in the era Merrill. If you're looking for gang green, those defenses and days are gone in today's NFL. You're not going to see those style of defense. Did you always think this would be a work in progress? Well, I, I was out playing golf. It was just, we were playing golf. Uh, together and just enjoying the day. And I said, what do you think of the defense? And he said, ask me in November. But I don't think he was expecting any big problems. I just think he's a veteran coach and he knows that it takes a while to really assess the defense. Some of them start out great, like gangrene. And then once they're figured out, they become just green. <laughs> you know, so you don't you don't know. But uh, I think he's, he's conservative in his thinking, he's not going to start looking for uh, miracles early in the season. But I think he's the thing that I think he's most disappointed in is the tackling has been so bad. He said they leave their feet too early and they don't wrap up. And this is something they are preaching to them every single day. Wrap up, feet in the air, go after the player. But some of this is the product of not tackling during the preseason. And you but you would think after game four, you know, by game four, they'd be able to straighten that out, but they haven't yet. Merrill, do you think the lack of preseason activity plays a factor in the tackling and not being prepared when it comes to conditioning? Because, again, you look at a team like Kansas City, those guys, I mean, Mahomes played two of the three preseason games and actually played a full half in one of them. And, again, Not that he's playing great. They're undefeated, though. But, again, do you think that that is a precursor and a little bit of collateral damage that, you know, they they do not use? And I know they get to team, organized team practices, but that's not the same as an in-game adjustment, or even Vic says it. That's not real football. He thinks real football. And I think he had a problem with those guys not playing more. But just your takeaway, do you think that's a little bit – I wonder what Mike Quick – says about that to you, and you guys talk about that back and forth. Do you think there's a little to that? It's a risk-reward. If you want to take the risk and think that if you stay healthy in camp and you get through it, it's going to pay off early. Uh, But here's what bothered me. Uh, They didn't do much. They they had longer practices this year. They did. They weren't just hit the field and then go in. They worked hard. They worked really hard, but they did not tackle to the ground. And they go into the first game against Green Bay in Brazil, and they won. So I figured, all right. So it worked out. They didn't get anybody injured in the preseason, and they won in their first game, and they tackled. So at least now the tackling is going to start to get better. Inexplicably, it really hasn't. Although you you take that third game, and they tackled like demons when they were playing against the Saints in the Superdome. They tackled then, but again, they slipped and it was, they missed 15 tackles the other night, the other day in Tampa, 15 tackles. That's not good. You know, Merrill, I I think that like, and you have said this on this program, I think injuries are just, you know, when your time's up, you're going to get hurt. It's what it is, whether you're playing in preseason or not, because look at what the Eagles did last year. They didn't play any preseason. They got out to a 10 and one start. Nobody was injured. All of a sudden this year, nobody played in the preseason. Almost everybody in the offense is injured. So doesn't it come down to, hey, it's just a part of the schedule on where you're going to face that. Like 22, don't you agree, was an anomaly where you had the same 22 in September starting that you had in February 
on the 14th when he started in the Super Bowl. You don't see that, Merrill. That that yeah. look at your 17th Super Bowl. You didn't have a left tackle. You didn't have a middle linebacker, and you didn't even have an MVP quarterback playing. And you guys still ended up going on and winning it. So you it just, you even, you even lost your kicker. And yeah, they, you, lost, you had everything going wrong, and you still won. And they picked up Jake Elliott from the practice squad of the Bengals, and he was a catalyst. I mean, he he won the game with a 61-yarder against the Giants that changed the season. So that was sheer luck that he was out there and you were able to get him when Sturgis got cut or got hurt. But I, I don't know. It's 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 You're right. That year, everybody got hurt. So there's no right or wrong to this yep. thing. Of course, it does pay. You have a much better chance of winning if you do stay healthy. It's rare that a backup quarterback can come in like Nick Foles and play the best three games of his life, including the Super Bowl, which was the best game of his life. That's that's a rarity, but it just happened. You know, you know Merrill, you're right. The risk reward. I mean, do I want to get Jalen Hurts or AJ Brown injured in a Jets game in a preseason, or would I rather at least take the gamble of someone saying this to me? Well, he got hurt in week four of the regular season. I would much not that I want either, but I would much rather go. Well, at least it mattered. You know, I don't want to get my players injured when it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, holy cow, that's like walking out of your house and getting hurt. I mean, I don't want those guys. So I I I probably agree with you because again, too, you know, that you're you're looking at risk reward with that. Let me let me go over to um Nick Sirianni here. You're obviously hearing it, what's going on in the city. You're hearing a lot of the negativity that's going on. They want them replaced. Yeah, you're hearing a lot of people putting it on him. I think it comes with the territory of being the Philadelphia Eagle head coach. Yeah. Okay. But um, in your opinion, unjust, warranted, um, expected. I mean, they're two and two. It's not like they're own four, which is true here. Um, how do you see how people are looking? Especially now the media, you have Marcus Hayes, who came on last week, is saying that it's time to start talking about firing Nick Sirianni. Um, this is the Philadelphia Inquirer now. This isn't some hammerhead like me saying it. That's Marcus, who I have great respect for. How do you see all this? Actually, actually, he concluded that column by saying he wouldn't fire Nick. Okay. He, he said the Nick watch is on. And, you know, somebody texted me, a friend, and he said to me, uh, are Nick and Doug both on the hot seat? And I said, yes. Um and so are probably 26 other coaches. I, that comes with the territory. And in Philadelphia, you lose a couple of games and, and look bad doing so. It's, it's time to start thinking about a coach. And, you know, he's had a couple of decisions that I have second-guessed. Go for it on fourth down. Don't go for it. Try the field goal, whatever. But I, I, it's, they're not going to fire Nick Sirianni right now. I mean, Nick Sirianni is, is here for the season. This is not Jeffrey Lurie's style. In the time that Jeffrey Lurie's been the owner, only one coach has been fired before the end of the season, and that was Chip Kelly in the next to the last week, got up at his Monday press conference and said, well, I don't have anything to do with personnel. And Jeffrey had just about had it, and he couldn't get him out the door fast enough. So that was the only coach that he's ever fired with a game left. And it, it just doesn't happen here. Jeffrey will wait and evaluate the season with Howie and decide what do we have to do to get better next year. And if that is replacing the head coach, when that will be their decision. But I don't believe anything's going to happen till the season ends. And they could have a disappointing season and the two of them can get together and say, hey, Nick's a good head coach. This is not on Nick. This happened, that happened, this happened. So they're, they're not going to make rash in the middle of the season decisions. As far as the fans are concerned, Dan, I think they're the greatest fans in the world. I love them. They are, they are so passionate. They love this team so much. But with love comes suffering. And with <laughs> suffering comes change. Let's, let's figure this thing out. So it's either the coach or the quarterback. You know, you don't you don't hear anybody say, "Let's get rid of the left guard." You know, that doesn't happen. I'll echo off what you just said here, and I'll expand on this. Then, and you tell me, you're around these guys. 
you know, it's being reported. And again, this is people from 35,000 feet sometimes saying these mm -hmm. kind of comments or trying to dissect and be a psychiatrist. When you hear a guy say something, you know how people can expand off that stuff, Merrill. I mean, you know, it looks like people are reporting that, you know, Jalen Hurts and the head coach, they can't stand one another. Do you buy into that? No. No. I I speak to Jalen probably more than any member of the media. I have a chance to chat with him in the locker room, and he's he's always been very candid with me. He's never said anything negative about Nick Sirianni. And Nick praises Jalen Hurts and uh, defends him at times. But um, I haven't I haven't personally seen anything that would tell me that they're at odds with one another. That That's the truth. A couple more questions for you, Merrill. Um, are you more concerned about what, what do you think? Because right now it's the quarterback and it's the defense that are wobbling. Um, and I'll use that word, wobbling. You're two and two. It's not a disaster, but it's wobbling. You get a great performance like New Orleans on the road, and you get a dud like that. And Tampa is not a great team. But they're well coached. I mean, there's some great coaches. Uh, we had a brand new coordinator that was his first coordinator, four first four games that he's ever had, uh, Liam Cohen. So I mean, Baker Mayfield has been a reclamation project that has panned out. What do you think is your biggest concern moving forward? The defense getting better or Hurts getting better? Everything getting better. Everything. I think if if they improve their fundamentals this week. And come out Sunday, a week from Sunday, against the Cleveland Browns fast. They've got to come roaring out of the locker room and not take a breath until they move back into the locker room at halftime. If they go all out and put some points on the board, they're going to get back in the win column and they're going to right the ship. Because the following week they have the Giants. And the following week they have the Bengals. And these are certainly winnable games. So I think the, I think the key is... Just get back, do what you do best, and win. That, that's what I think it is. I think it's not one thing. It's a lot of things where the Eagles are not playing up to the level that we expect. Do you think that offense misses Lane more? Do you think it misses A.J. more? Both. <laughs> if, if You know what's crazy, Dan? Uh, I don't have the stat with me. But if you look at the games that Lane has started and the record – and it's like 68% versus like 39% or something. Incredible. He makes a big difference. He makes a big difference. Now, I mean, the other linemen are all playing well. Jordan Mailata is playing well. He's a great player. And the center, I heard John Ritchie say the other day that he's just been wowed by the things that Cam Jurgens is doing. They're great. I projected, I projected he would make the Pro Bowl. Yeah, he may. He may already. So he'll be back. He, he should be fine. He went out because of the heat, that he was oppressive and did drain guys and they needed some IVs. But uh, he'll be he'll be back. He's he's a terrific player. My lot is a terrific player. Landon Dickerson's a terrific player. On the other side, you have, I mean, you have uh, Lane, who is maybe and probably the best right tackle in all football. I have to ask you two more, if you can. Can I can I give can I get two here for you? Oh, yeah. Um, one thing. And the other guy who's going to come back, um, you probably haven't heard his name much, but he's probably going to come back. He's going to practice this coming week, and they have 21 days in which to activate him. And he's a terrific young player, and that is the safety, Sidney Brown. He yeah. should be. He'll Absolutely. help. He'll help. Are you surprised with Brandon Graham's play? No. Nothing Brandon Graham ever does will surprise Man. me. He, he's, he's the best D lineman right now. He, he is. He is. He's, he's amazing. Uh, Vic says, Brandon, you're not on a ceremonial tour. You're playing. You know, he says this is his last year, but that could change too. He still can play at the highest level. He's really played great football. Um, yeah. Have you been surprised? I asked you this the last time you were on, and I'm, I, I have, and maybe it's because it's, it's a me thing here, not a you thing, because you saw the kid at Penn State. Man, I think he's better than Shady McCoy. I think he's the best back that you have had here in Philly. I mean, Westbrook was so versatile in dual threat, could catch the ball, could run the ball, could block. 
But when he gets an open space, I mean, Merrill, he, he outruns everything. I mean, I've been really stunned that that guy has been who he has. Have, have you been surprised? I've been impressed. I've been impressed. I expected him to be great because he was great at Penn State. The problem with the Giants is he's been behind not even average offensive lines, offensive lines that were subpar. But I think behind the Eagles' offensive line, he can do it all. I'm not ready after four games to say that he's better than Shady McCoy because Shady McCoy, Shady McCoy will be honored here um, in a couple of weeks and go into the Eagles Hall of Fame. He is a great back, and he did it for several years. So uh, do I think that someday he could stand there and, and be right there with the best? Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not about to take Shady off his perch quite yet. I saved this last one here for you because Gary Player is a friend of ours. And I asked him what the hardest hole was at Marion. And I want you to tell me what you think the hardest hole is at Marion. The first hole, because yes, yes, yes. He's sitting there under the awning on the veranda, of watching you as you tee off. And, and you know, we honored Scott and I, our wonderful head pro, last Friday night at a dinner. And Scott talked about the fact that you know he was only glad that he wasn't left-handed because everybody stares at you. And my my wife teed off there; she almost had a nervous breakdown. So you, you just hit it from there. It's not the hardest in terms of, of, of the way it's set up. I mean, you can you can get an easy bogey there, but it's 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 a it's a little bit frightening. And it's narrow. I it's mean it, narrow. It, it, it dog lays a little to the right. It's yeah, beautiful. you know, because Gary, when I was on in Tampa, he lit, he has a place down in Naples. And so I talk to him every now and then and you know the Black Knight and all that. He has a really great brand. He sends me golf clubs sometimes. He sent me a wedge. And so I I, I text him and I go, I can't, you know, Mel Reese is the voice of the Eagles and he plays at Marion. He goes, oh my God, it's one of the old school second shot golf courses of all time. It's one of the great, is it a, is it a Bob Ross course? No, it's a Hugh Wilson course. It's a Hugh Wilson course. Okay. And he said that it's narrow as heck. And when the U.S. Open um, rough is up, it's impossible when you get it in the rough to get it out. It's a it's a bogey no matter what. He said it's a shot maker's golf course. And I go, all right. So I'm going to ask him what the tough one. He goes, I'll tell you what. Every time I'm on that first tee, I go, I don't know what it is, man. Every eyeball on the planet is watching you, man. And he goes, you pucker up a little bit when you're on that first tee. You know what the truth of the matter is? They probably don't. They're probably really not watching us. They're eating their lunch. They're eating their dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but they're there. <laughs> now, if Gary Player's there, they're watching him. <laughs> But I don't think anybody cares what Merrill and Cindy Reese are doing on the first hole. I think that's not true, but way to go, <laughs> Merrill, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You'll have a bye week this week. I'm sure you're hearing it all right now, but thank you so much for finding time. Thank you again, my friend. Thank you, Dan. It's always fun being on with you. You got it. That is the great Merrill Reese, and I so appreciate him coming aboard. The legendary voice of the Philadelphia Eagles. It is always great getting him on. Please hit the like button here, guys. Don't forget, we will have on tomorrow, we will have on Doc Walker at 4.30. My CTE was kicking. Thank you, Xander. We will have Mark Holmes is going to take victory laps. Philly 500 is going to take the walk of shame. Okay? It's going to take the walk of shame. And there you go. Look, M. Reyes feels better about his life. Merrill is giving you all the things you want to hear and things you always hear, especially with the media in Philly. And you know what? Someone will go, Seals, why don't you kill Mer Why would I kill Merrill? I know what Merrill is. He's the voice of the Eagles. He's not going to talk shit on him. Why would I want to beat him down? Why would I beat him down? It's a different perspective plus i'm not shitting on merrill reese okay
<laughs> Meryl says something. That's his opinion. I'm running with it. Not my opinion. I think Hertz stinks right now. Okay, but I think, Ch hey, Chips and Birds is right. Merle's seen it all. He's probably seen the peaks and valleys. Well, I wouldn't go so much that I'm a gentleman, MG2. I'm a gentleman to certain people. Like M. Reyes, he can kiss my ass. Okay? M. Reyes can kiss my ass. Okay? Yeah, I mean, 